Welcome to a course on Rape Trauma Stress Disorder, brought to you by allceus.com. Rape is a pervasive medical, legal, psychological, and social problem that affects people of all races, genders, and socioeconomic statuses. When someone is a survivor of rape, they must make difficult decisions in the midst of a crisis. Difficult decisions include reporting the rape or not reporting the rape. Unfortunately, a lot of the evidence is time sensitive, so it is crucial that in this time of crisis, the person makes the decision at the very least to go have the exam if they think that they may want to report either now or at some point in the future. PTSD is very common in rape survivors and support from individuals, families, and communities is essential in their recovery. The first thing that has to happen for a lot of people is they have to label the experience as rape. And the question arises, is it necessary to label something as rape necessary for recovery? Well, there's a lot of controversy about that. It's been found that those who label their experiences of rape have greater incidence of PTSD symptoms, long-term decreased physical and psychological well-being. Now, you could also postulate that those who label their experience as rape had a more significant encounter, whatever it was. It was more violent. It involved a stranger. There was something different about it that made it just unmistakably rape as opposed to those people who may be survivors of rape but don't label it as rape. Um, and this more commonly occurs in, in relationships, in, um, how shall I put it, business transactions. Um, so it's one of those things that we have to look at. Is it the label that makes, labeling it that makes it, seemingly more difficult to deal with, or is it the fact that the experience itself was more difficult to deal with, but it was unquestionably labeled rape? Some people argue that it may be necessary for a survivor to integrate their experience by labeling what they've experienced as rape. You could, again, go at it from the different perspective of there are a lot of different ways they can integrate this experience as opposed to just the one way of being a rape survivor. That is something the individual has to decide how they're going to deal with that, their loss of a sense of safety and security, their sense of violation, their fear, their whatever repercussions may come from it if it were a relationship involved rape or, heaven forbid, a family involved rape. Uh, so you need to consider what the ramifications are for the person of labeling it as rape. And even those things that are clearly rape may cause the person more harm as far as difficulty integrating it in the long run based on their culture. Some cultures are just not going to accept rape as acceptable um, or a survivor of rape as being acceptable. And unfortunately, even in this day and age, that's true. So what's going to happen if the person was raped and if they label it as rape if and when their family finds out? So do they need to label it as rape in order to get help? Hopefully, we've come as far enough in a society that that's not true, that people can get help even if they have difficulty acknowledging it or culturally just can't bear the thought of identifying it as rape. When labeling and reporting rape, relationship between the victim and perpetrator is the key. Intimate partner rape is a whole lot less likely to be reported than acquaintance or stranger rape in that order. Intimate partner rape being between boyfriend and girlfriend or husband and wife is almost never reported. 
acquaintance rape, um, date rape, is reported more often, but it's still grossly underreported. And stranger rape is reported a whole lot more often to the extent that probably 80% of stranger rapes are reported. So it makes it seem like stranger rape is more common than intimate partner or, or acquaintance rape. The fact is that those just happen to be reported more often because as a society we tend to blame the victim less for a stranger rape than we do for intimate partner or date rape. Some people believe in a blitz rape script. It's something that the man or woman, but generally a man, comes in, attacks the person, gets out, and it's just a bing, bang, boom, we're done. So if the rape itself does not fit that description, then people have more difficulty labeling it as rape and more difficulty reporting it and getting it believed and actually pursued as rape. The amount of force or injury suffered in, a, in an assault also affects, unfortunately again, the believability of the rape report. The, especially when it comes to a victim who knows her perpetrator. So if there was little force and very little injury suffered, it's a harder row to hoe for that person than it is if there were, was significant force or injury to show that there was a struggle. Peer influences and acceptance of aggressiveness in sexual encounters also affects labeling and reporting. If in this person's peer group, aggressive sex, rough sex, whatever you want to call it, is not unusual if the person may have engaged in fantasy play before that involved aggressiveness. It becomes harder, again, to label it as rape for them to really differentiate between you know, was this rape or was this, you know, some weird miscommunication. It becomes more difficult also if that peer group, that person's peer group, also engages in similar behaviors because they may dismiss the severity of the situation. And people who have a history of sex sexual victimization also tend to have different levels of reporting. They tend to report less, especially if they were sexually assaulted as children. Stranger versus acquaintance versus intimate partner rape. In intimate partner assaults, there are more non-genital injuries, um, fat lips, black eyes, broken ribs, and the non-genital injuries tend to be more severe in intimate partner rape than in acquaintance or stranger rape. In intimate partner rape, a lot of times what you're seeing is a symptom or a behavior that occurs within a relationship that on the broad scale is domestically violent. So that partner has used physical force to get his own way before with other things maybe and has no qualms about extending it to rape. Substance use is most common in acquaintance rape. So you have in intimate partner violence where substance use may or may not be a factor, but there's definitely a violence component. Um, substance use in acquaintance rape. Uh, a lot of times you hear of people going out on a date, getting intoxicated, and one thing leads to another, things go too far, um, and the girl says no, or at a fraternity party, you know, things, people get drunk and things go awry and there are lots of excuses 
that tend to come when alcohol is introduced. But you can see how an acquaintance in an acquaintance situation or in a date situation, in a party situation, substance use is almost, well, not almost always there, but is there a lot of the time. Um, so you can attribute part of it to the disinhibition from the substances. That doesn't excuse anyone's behavior by any means. Um, and then in stranger rape, there's usually not a whole lot of substance use involved. It's usually someone who is intentionally targeting whoever the victim is for one reason or another. Typical offenders of sexual violence have poor intimacy skills. They don't know how to get close to people. They can't get emotionally close to people. They can't empathize with people. They just don't have a grip of what other people are feeling. And they're very self-centered. It's a, all about them. They have low self-esteem. And they tend to be very lonely because they can't form these relationships. They can't bond with another person. They have an inability to empathize, can't develop empath empathy and intimacy. So they're lonely. An inability to cope and to deal with what's going on, to deal with sex, to handle intimate relationships without sex is also characteristic of these offenders. And cognitive distortions, convincing themselves that she wanted me, she wanted this, this is her role, this is her duty, um, whatever other excuses you may have heard, all kind of go in that cognitive distortion category where offenders find a way a lot of times, especially in acquaintance rape and in intimate partner rape, to justify their actions or to at least in, in their own mind excuse their actions. Sex offenders are more likely to misinterpret social cues and perceive things in ways that justify their offenses. That can be anything from the way a person dresses to the way a person walks to maybe somebody smiled at them. Just walking down the street smiled at them to be cordial, and they interpret that as the person coming on to them. Sex offenders often have a very low threshold for what they need to consider somebody hitting on them. Now, why they offend, there are some that are anger rapists. It's a power and control thing. It has nothing to do with sex. We've heard this before. Um, when it comes to raping children, on the other hand, there is a sexual gratification component. And children are the only ones they feel they can bond with intimately. Child molesters do tend to have a lower self-esteem than people who offend against adults. Um, they don't typically fit in very well with their peers. They don't feel like they're as adequate as a lot of their adult peers, which makes it harder for them to form relationships with adult partners. There are three phases of rape trauma. During the acute phase, the person expresses what's going on, can control what he or she is feeling to a certain extent, and there's also a shock component. So they're expressing it, but they're sort of in shock and have this controlled aura about them. Um, a lot of times, initially, in the acute phase, the person has dissociated to the point where they can handle reporting the rape and discussing it. Um, when they move to outward adjustment, there's minimi minimization and suppression of what happened. This is when those arguments about labeling it as rape or not labeling it really start to reach their peak because if they're coming, if they're working with a therapist who's coming from the perspective of you need to label it in order to integrate it, 
then that's not going to allow the person to minimize and suppress what's going on. On the other hand, it could lead them to dramatize it and have their life dominated by being a rape victim. Um, once they get to the place where they've integrated what's happened to them in whatever way is meaningful for them, either as a survivor of an unfortunate incident um, or a survivor of a rape or however they choose to couch it and make it meaningful to themselves, then they move on to explanation and analysis. This is what happened. This is how it happened. This is how I can prevent it from happening again. But there's also an element of escape. There are going to be triggers. There are going to be reminders of what happened. And so there will be times when the person just has to escape emotionally, mentally, maybe even physically from what's going on. And in this phase, there is still a fair amount of hypervigilance being overly aware of the person that walks behind you in the restaurant or being overly cautious about where you go on dates or what you do. Finally, the person moves on to resolution and full integration. They have found a way to accept what has happened, not like it, but accept it because it can't be taken away, and integrate it into, in their life in a way that they don't feel unsafe anymore. They aren't having constant flashbacks. They are able to move on and make some sense out of what happened. And how they do that depends on the person. Some people need to be a champion for victims' rights. Some people need to participate in take back the night walks. Some people journal. Some people write books. Some people participate in support groups. It really is up to that person. And it will be guided in many ways by how that person integrates what happened to them, what they need to do next. So far, we've only been talking about the individual. But once a person labels something as rape, or even if they don't label it as rape, once a, someone who is, has been sexually assaulted, they have to contend with the reactions of their family, their friends, and their so society. What is going to happen when I tell my family? Um, are they going to blame me? Are they going to blame the perpetrator? Are they going to understand what I'm going through? Are they going to be completely unable to cope? Um, what are my friends going to say? Are they going to be there to support me? Or are they going to say, well, you know, if you wouldn't have been doing X, Y, and Z, and blame me for what happened. And society. Society is even more detached from the individual, so they tend, society tends to be even more judgmental of people in general. Uh, how is society going to handle it when they hear about what happened? Or are they going to hear about what happened? If it is a rape in a small town, chances are it's going to be plastered all over the local paper. If it is a sexual assault that occurs at a fraternity house, chances are it's going to be plastered all over the university paper. Um, hopefully with the discretion to not reve reveal names, but then people are going to start talking about it. And you know they're talking about you if you're the victim. So how do you handle that if you hear people talking? A lot of people don't report because they fear being blamed, shamed, or ostracized. Going through the rape reporting process is a humiliating experience. You go from being assaulted once 
to having to tell a complete stranger what happened, to having to go to the hospital and tell another complete stranger what happened and be poked and prodded and given shots and have hair pulled out and all kinds of other things that just are not what you're able to handle at that particular point in time. No matter how compassionate the nurse is or the doctor or whomever does the rape kit. And then you go and you have to tell it over again to the attorney. And then you have to go and tell it over again on the stand if it goes to trial and get cross-examined and questioned and shamed in order to make the perpetrator look innocent. So a lot of people choose not to report because they can't handle going through our criminal justice system. When it comes to marital rape, that's almost, like I said earlier, almost never reported. And it's perceived differently by society from other kinds of rape. It's perceived as generally less serious because the couple already had, a, at least we assume, they already had a sexual relationship. Um, responsibility is sometimes assumed using the length of the marriage and the fidelity of the wife. So that already starts to blame the wife for what happened. They assume that the shorter the marriage is, the less traumatic it is, which I don't know if I'd agree with. Um, I don't agree with any of these, but I would tend to think it would be pretty shocking if you were married to somebody for 40 years. Um, but, and they did it for the first time, but if somebody's been engaging in marital rape for 40 years, at a certain point it's just people unfortunately accept that that's part of the way the life's going to be. And society also blames the wife who commits adultery and holds her more responsible for being raped than a wife who is faithful to her husband. And that's some weird perversion of the idea that rape is about power and control. And if she committed adultery, then she shamed him. And by raping her, he is regaining his power and control. You can see where it just doesn't, it doesn't wash. It's, it's, that's not how we settle our differences in a civilized manner. Now when we look at men's attitudes about sexual violence, 55 to 74 percent of college-aged men report using rape tactics. That's not just when they're inebriated. That's 55 to 74 percent. Almost three out of four men report using rape tactics. And sexually aggressive men tend to consume more alcohol than non-aggressive men. So you've got the ones who are more, have more of a tendency to rape women, consuming more alcohol, which is a disinhibitor, in a society or in a culture that holds rape tactics as common. I won't say they promote them. But if 74% of college-age men know about them and have used them, then it tells me that we're not doing a really good job of discouraging it. Sexual violence is correlated with rigid gender roles, stereotypes, psychopathology, sensa sensation-seeking, a past history of sexual violence, and hyper-masculine attitudes. That's all well and good. But it also, you need to look at peer pressure. If you have a young man who is trying to fit in with a peer group who holds rigid gender roles and hypermasculine attitudes, then someone who doesn't fit these characteristics may still be able to commit a rape in order to fit in because all of his friends are doing it or whatever. And just like my mother said to me and every sitcom in the world has said, if, if your best friend went and walked off the Golden Gate Bridge, would you do it too? Well, no, but 
if there was a lot of peer pressure to try to bungee jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, a lot of people might. And that's where it, if there's, if you walk off the Golden Gate Bridge, you're pretty much dead. If you bungee jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, okay, there's a chance you could die. There's a chance you could hurt yourself, but you're probably going to survive. Likewise, rape is so underreported that even if it does happen, it's like that bungee rope. Chances of it getting reported and you getting in trouble are not so great, so it's easier to convince somebody to try to do it. When it comes to coping with rape, women are more likely to disclose to informal supports than formal supports. So they're going to go home and they're going to tell their family, or they're going to tell their roommate, or they're going to tell their boyfriend, who will then talk to them and usually help them decide whether they're going to report it to the police or to the hospital. If the support persons are positive and empathetic and understanding, then the survivor tends to have a much better recovery period. If that initial period right after the rape is characterized by one of support and empathy, the person is much more able to adjust than if they start meeting resistance from the get-go. Negative reactions, such as indifference, blaming, anger, even if it's anger at the perpetrator, increase the psychological trauma and likelihood of PTSD. Um, at the point when someone comes to you and reveals that they've been raped, the important thing is to hear them and hear where they're coming from and put your own feelings aside. And that's challenging for a lot of people and even a lot of therapists. Acute stress disorder is more likely to advance to full PTSD. So if someone develops ASD in the context of the aftermath of a rape, they are more likely to advance to full PTSD. Your social supports are your greatest buffers of that, as well as, obviously, how the rape took place, whether it was an intimate date or stranger rape, and how well it fit the script. There are a lot of things that kind of go in there, but all of those things also play into whether somebody develops ASD or they integrate the experience easier and start to deal with it without having major negative repercussions. PTSD is an extremely common reaction to sexual assault. People become hypervigilant, anxious, depressed, and have frequent panic attacks. When they smell that smell that reminds them, when they hear the sound of footsteps, when they hear a sound that reminds them, when they go to sleep, they have nightmares. During the day, they may have flashbacks when something on TV reminds them of it. And they can also start having difficulty with personal and intimate relationships because that whole part of them is starting to dissociate and sort of encapsulize because it's too difficult to face reminders of the rape and sex is a reminder of the rape. The assault severity, the level of violence and physical injury, the number of victimizations, and the avoidance of coping are highly correlated with PTSD. So someone who immediately delves into a deep depression or into a bottle of Jim Beam or starts taking sleeping pills like there's no tomorrow, those are signs that this person is going to have a much more difficult time coping than someone who faces it head on and starts trying to integrate what happened. As assault severity increases, survivors are less likely to blame themselves and more likely to label, label it as rape. 
We talked about that earlier. Once it becomes clear, there, there's not a, well, was this rape? Did I send the wrong signals? Did I do this? Did I do that? This is what society says. All that gets very murky. When there's something that's very clearly rape, it's easier for somebody to label it as such and not blame themselves. Does that make it easier for them to integrate and adjust to? No. That's not necessarily true because that means the world is a very scary place if something like that can happen and they didn't do anything to provoke it. Um, so having that understanding doesn't mean they're going to integrate it any better. Immediately following a rape, people deny what's going on. They suppress their emotions. They try to avoid stressful thoughts. And they feel overwhelmed because they don't have the resources to deal with what's going on right now. In the short term, that's healthy because they're probably right. They don't have the resources. In the long term, if they keep suppressing it and denying it and making excuses for it and saying, oh, you know, it is what it is, it happened, it's over, or whatever, that's not healthy. For long-term processing of the trauma, the person needs to talk about it, but not like they're talking about it when they're reporting it to the police or when they're reporting it to the courts or whatever. They need to talk about it with an empathetic person who can help them understand what went on and how they feel and identify all the different layers of emotions and feelings and whatever else that happened then and are happening now and can help, help them accept the lack of control in a situation. And for a lot of people, this is the hardest thing, is to accept the lack of control. Believe it or not, a lot of rape victims continuously look through a significant portion of their recovery period for what was it that I did that brought this on because I must have had some control in this. What didn't I do that I should have done? When in actuality, a lot of times, most of the time, they had no control in it. <clears throat> Rape alters a person's view of the world and their personal schemas. Integrating rape as something that just happens doesn't alter the behavior of the survivor, but it also doesn't facilitate coping. Accommodating to it means it changes their schemas and worldviews a little bit, but it doesn't let the rape take over their lives. They don't live in fear. They don't become agoraphobic. They are not panicked every time somebody walks too close to them. But they do realize that there are certain inherent dangers. Over-accommodation is when the person starts to view that everything's all bad, evil is everywhere, I can't trust anyone, I can't go anywhere, I'm not safe. And this quickly leads to agoraphobia. Over-accommodation for a very short period, not going to be a huge problem most of the time. And it's not all that uncommon initially for the whole world to just be painfully scary. But that shouldn't last for weeks or months. In order to help this person get back into the world and have their basic needs met, realize that they are safe, and there are steps they can do to keep themselves safe. One of the greatest things is having social support. Social support from friends, from other rape survivors, social support from family, the av availability of emotional and physical resources. Okay, we understand the emotional part. 
They have to have somebody they can talk to, someone they can lean on. But physical resources, what does that mean? <clears throat> right after a person's been raped, they're in crisis. Doing the normal day-to-day -day things isn't as easy. Physical resources can encompass things like having somebody to help them get the laundry done, get the food made, get the kids picked up from school, help them do their day-to-day -day activities because they're too exhausted right now. And again, that shouldn't last for very long. But helping them take time out for themselves at this point often promotes resilience. It gives them the ability to divert that energy that would have been spent running to the dry cleaner or doing this or that to focus on regaining their own en energy and regaining their own sense of things. And positive reactions of formal support systems and informal support systems. I mean, if the family and friends are supportive and law enforcement is supportive and the attorney who's working on the case is supportive and the victim advocates are there and do their job and return phone calls and all of that stuff. If the system works, it helps a person move through the process of recovery a whole lot better than if they feel like they're being subjected to re-victimization or not being heard or put in situations that make them uncomfortable again. Agency responses to rape include a denial of the problem, racism, sexism, and societal attitudes, lack of funding and poor salaries for workers, high turnover and burnout, lack of professionalism, and lack of ab ability and accessibility of resources and services. OK, well, so what agency are we talking about? Law enforcement and the legal system for one. A lot of law enforcement, and not all of them, tend to have more rigid gender role attitudes and have difficulty assimilating the concept of rape to be as broad as intimate partner rape and acquaintance rape. So denying the problem exists in many cases when people try to report, make it a lot harder for everyone else who tries to report. Lack of funding for education to educate workers about the problem of rape. High turnover and burnout in not only law enforcement, but also victim advocacy and counseling. A person has difficulty moving through the process if they have a different therapist every month, or if their caseworker just drops off the face of the earth. And lack of avail availability and accessibility of resources and services. If something happens in a rural county, and the closest victim advocate is in the nearest big town, and they have to go there to, for court, and they don't have transportation, or they, don't, they can't get to counseling because they'd have to drive 50 miles, that's not real helpful. And in those ways, the agencies are not doing their part to help this person recover. Our society is not putting out enough of a safety net. Ultimately, as therapists, caseworkers, or victim advocates, what we can do to help people move through the recovery process is to help them identify where they're at when we first meet them, what resources they have, what strengths they have, what areas they may need additional resources in, and help them link with those resources. Further, if you're a therapist, it's also appropriate to talk with the person and help them understand how they're beginning to conceptualize it and help them figure out how they're going to deal with 
and integrate what has happened and what they're going to do with it in order to keep it from overtaking their lives. You can go to allceus.com in order to take the quiz and earn your CEUs on this course now.